Hi guys. Hi. I'm coming on to read to you chapter 10 of the Cold Front Sunrise series. I hope Started. So, chapter 10. My blood froze as a creeping, leeching cold lurched by. I couldn't see anything, just a vague shimmering in the corner of my vision. But my horse stiffened beneath me. I willed my face into blankness. Even the balmy spring woods seemed to recoil to wither and freeze. The cold thing whispered past, circling. I could see nothing, but I could feel it. And in the back of my mind, an ancient hollow voice whispered, I will grind your bones between my claws. I will drink your marrow. I will feast on your flesh. I am what you fear. I am what you dread. I tried to swallow, but my throat had closed up. I kept my eyes on the trees, on the canopy, on anything but the cold mass circling us again and again. Look at me. I wanted to look. I needed to see what it was. Look at me. I stared at the gorse trunk of a distant elm, thinking of pleasant things, like hot bread and full bellies. I will fill my belly with you. I will devour you. Look at me. A starry, unclouded night sky, peaceful, glittering and endless. Summer sunrise. A refreshing bath in a forest pool. Meetings with Isaac, losing myself for an hour or two in his body, in our shared breaths. It was all around us so cold that my teeth chattered. Look at me. I stared and stared at the ever nearing tree trunk, not daring to blink. My eyes strained, filling with tears. I let them fall, refusing to acknowledge the thing that lurked around us. Look at me. And just as I thought I would give in, my eyes hurt so much from not looking. The cold disappeared into the bush, leaving a trail of still, recoiling plants behind it. Only after Lucian exhaled and our horses shook their heads did I dare sag in my seat. Even the crocuses seemed to straighten again. What was that? I asked, brushing the tears away from my face. Lucian's face was still pale. You don't want to know. Please, was it that cereal you mentioned? Lucian's russet eye was dark as he answered hoarsely. No, it was a creature that should not be in these lands. We call it a bog. You cannot hurt it and you cannot kill it, even with your beloved ash arrows. Why can't I look at it? Because when you look at it, when you acknowledge it, that's when it becomes real. That's when it can kill you. A shiver spider walked down my spine. This was the Pyrumphian I had expected. The creatures that made humans speak of them in hushed tones even now. The reason I hadn't hesitated, not for a heartbeat, when I considered the possibility of that wolf being a fairy. I heard its voice in my head. It told me to look. Lucian rolled his shoulders. Well, thank the cauldron that you didn't. Cleaning up that mess would have ruined the rest of my day. He gave me a wan smile. I didn't return it. I still heard the bog's voice whispering between the leaves, calling to me. 
After an hour of meandering through the trees hardly speaking to each other, I stopped trembling enough to turn to him. So you're old, I said, and you're carrying around a sword and going on a fool to patrol? Did you fight in the first war? Fine, perhaps I hadn't quite let go of my curiosity about his eye. He winked. Shit, Ava, I'm not that old. Are you a warrior, though? Would you be able to kill me if it ever came to that? Lucian huffed a laugh. Not as good as Tan, but I know how to handle my weapons. He patted the hilt of his sword. Would you like me to teach you how to wield a blade, or do you already know how, O oh mighty mortal huntress? If you took down Andreas, you probably don't need to learn anything. Only where to aim, right? He tapped on his chest. I don't know how to use a sword. I only know how to hunt. Same thing, isn't it? For me, it's different. Lucian fell silent, considering. I suppose you humans are such hateful cowards that you would have let yourself curled up and waited to die if you'd known it beyond a doubt what Andreas truly was. Insufferable Lucian sighed as he looked me over. Do you ever stop being so serious and dull? Do you ever stop being such a prick? I snapped back. Dead, really, truly, I should have been dead for that. But Lucian grinned at me much better. Alice, it seemed, had not been wrong. Whatever tentative truth we had built that afternoon vanished at the dinner table. Tamlin was lounging in his usual seat, a long claw out encircling his goblet. It paused on the lift as soon as I entered, Lucian on my heels. His green eyes pinned me to the spot. Right, I'd brushed him off that morning, claiming I wanted to be alone. Tamlin slowly sh looked at Lucian, whose face had turned grave. We went on a hunt. Lucian said. I heard, Tamlin said roughly, glancing between us as we took our seats. And did you have fun? Slowly his claw sank back into his flesh. Lucian didn't answer. Leaving it to me, coward. I cleared my throat. Sort of, I said. Did you catch anything? Every word was clipped out. No, Lucian gave me a pointed cough as if urging me to say more, but I had nothing to say. Tamlin stared at me for a long moment, then dug into his food, not all that interested in talking to me either. Then Lucian quietly said, Tan. Tan looked up, more animal than fae, in those green eyes. A demand for whatever it was Lucian had to say. Lucian's throat popped. A bog was in the forest today. Fork in Tamlin's hand folded in on itself. He said with lethal calm, You ran into it. Lucian nodded. It moved past but came close. It must have snuck through the border. Metal groaned as Tamlin's claws punched out, obliterating the fork. He rose to his feet with a powerful sweep of movement. I tried not to tremble at the contained fury at how his canine seemed to lengthen. As he said, where in the forest? Lucian told him. Tamlin grew and threw a glance in my direction before stalking out of the room and shutting the door behind him with unnerving gentleness. Lucian loosed a breath, pausing, uh, pushing his way, his heart beating fierce and rubbing at his temples. Where is he going? I asked, staring towards the door to hunt the brogue. He said it could be. Killed, but you can't face it. Tan can. My breath caught a bit. The huff high fay, half heartedly flattering me, was capable of killing a thing like the bogue. And yet he served him, me himself that first night, offering me a life rather than death. I'd known he was lethal, that he was a warrior of sorts. But so he went to hunt the bog. Where we were earlier today? Lucian shrugged. If he's going to pick up a trail, it would be there. 
I had no idea how anyone could face that immortal horror, but it wasn't my problem. And just because Lucien wasn't going to eat anymore didn't mean I wouldn't. Lucien lost in the fort, didn't even notice the feast was down. I returned to my room and awake and with nothing else to do, began monitoring the garden beyond for signs of life or Tanvin returning. He didn't come back. I sharpened the knife I'd hidden away on a bit of stone I'd taken from the garden. An hour passed and still Tanvin didn't return. The moon showed her face, casting the garden below in silver and shadow. Ridiculous, utterly ridiculous to watch for his return, to see if he could indeed survive against the vogue. I turned from the window, about to drag myself into bed, but something moved out in the garden. I lunged for the curtain beside the window, not wanting to be caught waiting for him, and peered out. Not Tamlin, but someone lurked by the hedges facing the house, looking towards me. Mail hunched, and the breath went out of me as the fairy hobbled closer, just two steps into the light leaking from the house. Not a fairy but a man, my father. Chapter 11 I didn't give myself a chance to panic, no doubt, to do anything but wish I had stolen some food from my breakfast table as I layered on tunic after tunic and bundled myself in a cloak, stuffing the knife I'd stolen into my boot. The extra clothes in the satchel would be just a burden to carry. My father, my father had come to take me, to save me, whatever benefits Tamlin had given him upon my departure couldn't have been too tempting then, maybe he had sn had a ship prepared to take us far far away, maybe he had somehow sold the cottage and gotten enough money to set up a new place in a new continent. My father, my crippled broken father had come, a quick survey of the ground beneath my window revealed no one outside, and the silent house told me no one had spotted my father yet. He was still waiting by the hedge, now beckoning to me, at least Tamlin had not returned, with a final glance at my room, listening for anyone approaching. From the hall, I grasped the nearby trellis of wisteria and eased down it. I winced at the crunch of gravel beneath my boots, but my father was already moving towards the outer gate, limping along with his cane. How had they even gotten here? There had to be horses nearby then. He was hardly wearing enough clothing for the winter that would await us once we crossed the wall, but I'd laid on so much that I could spare him some items if need be. Keeping my movements light and silent, carefully avoiding the light of the moon, I hurried after my father. He moved with surprising swiftness towards the darkened hedges and the gate beyond. Only a few hall candles were burning outside the house. I didn't dare breathe too loudly, didn't dare call for my father as he limped towards the gate. If we left now, if he indeed had horses, we could be halfway home by the time they realised I was gone. Then we'd flee, flee Tamlin, flee the blight that could soon invade our lands. My father reached the gates. They were already open, the dark forest beyond beckoning. He must have hidden the horses deeper in. He turned towards me, that familiar face drawn tight, those brown eyes clear for once, and beckoned, hurry. Hurry, every movement of his hand seemed to shout. My heart was what a raging beast beat in my chest, in my throat. Only a few feet now to him, to freedom, to a new life. A massive hand wrapped around my arm, going somewhere. Shit, shit, shit. Tamlin's claws poked through my layers of clothing as I looked up at him in unabashed terror. I didn't dare move. Not as his lips thinned and the muscles in his jaw quivered. Not as he opened his mouth, I glimpsed fangs, long throat tearing fangs, tearing fangs. 
shining in the moonlight. He was going to kill me. Kill me right there, and then kill my father. No more loopholes, no more flattery, no more mercy. He didn't care anymore. I was as good as dead. Please, I breathed. My father, your father. He lifted his stare to the gate behind me, and then his growl rumbled through me as he bared his teeth. Why don't you look again? He released me. I staggered back, a step, well, sucking in a breath to tell my father to run, but he wasn't there. Only a pale bow quiver of pale arrow remained, propped up against the gate. Mountain ash, they hadn't been there but moments before. Hadn't they rip rippled as if they were nothing but water, and then the bow and quiver became a large pack, laddened with supplies. Another ripple, and they were my sisters, huddled together, weeping. My knees buckled. What is? I didn't finish the question. My father now stood there, still hunched and beckoning, a flawless rendering. Weren't you warned to keep your wits about you? Tamlin snapped. That your human senses would betray you. He stepped beyond me and let out a snarl so vicious that whatever the thing was by the gates, she made with light and darted out as fast as lightning streaking through the dark. Fool, he said to me, turning. If you're ever going to run away, at least do it in the daytime. He stared me down and the fangs slowly retracted, the claws remained. There are worse things than the fog prowling these woods at night. That thing at the gates isn't one of them, and it still would have taken a good long while devouring you. Somehow my mouth began working again, and of all the things to say I blurted, can you blame me? My crippled father appears beneath my window. You think I'm not going to run for him? Did you actually think I'd gladly stay here forever, even if you'd taken care of my family, or for some treaty that no has nothing to do with me and allows your kind to slaughter humans as you see fit? flexed his fingers as if trying to get the claws back in, but they remained out, ready to slice through flesh and bone. What do you want, Vera? I want to go home. Home to what, exactly? You'd prefer that miserable human existence to this. I made a promise, I said, my breathing ragged, to my mother when she died, that I'd look after my family, that I'd take care of them. All I have done every single day, every hour, has been for that vow. And just because I was hunting to save my family to put food in their bellies, I'm now forced to break it. He stalked towards the house and gave him a, I gave him a wide berth before falling into step behind him. His claws slowly, slowly retracted. He didn't look at me as he said, You are not breaking your vow. You are fulfilling it, and then some, by staying here. Your family is better cared for now than they were when you were there. Those chipped, miscoloured paintings inside the cottage flashed in my vision. Perhaps they would forget who had even painted them in the first place. Insignificant, that's what all those years I have given them would be. As insignificant as I was to these high faith. And that dream I'd had of one day living with my father with enough food and money and paint. It had been my dream, no one else's. I rubbed up my chest. I just can't give up on it, and on them, no matter what you say. Even if I had been a fool, a stupid human fool, to believe my father would ever actually come to me. Tamlin's eyes eyed me sidelong. You're not giving up on them, living in luxury, stuffing myself with food, how is that not? They are cared for, they are fed and comfortable, fed and comfortable, he couldn't lie, if it was true then, then it was beyond anything I'd ever do, dared hope for, then my, ma my vow to my mother was fulfilled, it stunned me enough that I didn't say anything for a moment as we walked, my life was now owned by the treaty, but perhaps I'd been freed in another sort of way. We neared the sweeping stairs that led into the manor, and I finally asked, 
Lucy goes on border control, border patrol, and you've mentioned other sentries, yet I've never seen one here. Where are they all? At the border, he said, as if that were a suitable answer. Then he added, we don't need sentries if I'm here, because he was deadly enough. I tried not to think about it, but still I asked, were you trained as a warrior then? Yes. When I didn't reply, he added, I spent most of my life in my father's war band on the borders, training as a warrior to one day serve him or others. Running these lands was not supposed to fall to me. The flatness in which he said it told me enough that how he felt about his current title, about why the presence of his silver-tongued friend was necessary, but it was too personal, too demanding to ask what had occurred to the change in his circumstances so greatly. So I cleared my throat and said, What manner of fairies prowl the woods beyond this gate, if the bog isn't the worst of them? What was that thing? What I'd meant to ask was, what would have tortured and eaten me? Who are you to be so powerful that they pose no threat to you? He paused on the bottom step, waiting for me to catch up. A pucker. They use your own desires to lure you to some remote place. They then eat you, slowly. He probably smelt your human scent in the woods and followed it to the house. I shivered and didn't bother to hide it. Tamlin went on. These lands used to be well guarded. The deadlier fairies were contained within the borders of their native territories, monitored by the local fey lords, or driven into Iden. Creatures like the Pucker would never have dared set foot here, but now the sickness that infected Five Indian has weakened the wards that have kept them out. A long pause, like the words were choked out of him. Things are different now. It's not safe to travel alone at night, especially if you're human, because humans were defenceless, defenceless as babes compared to natural-born predators like Lucian and Tamlin, who didn't need weapons to hunt. I glanced at its hand but found no trace of claws, only tanned, callous skin. What else is different now? I asked, trailing him up the marble front steps. He didn't stop this time, didn't even look over his shoulder to see me, as he said, everything. So I truly was to live here forever, as much as I longed to ensure that Tamla's word about my caring for my family was true. As much as his claim that I was taking better care of my family by staying away, even if I was truly fulfilling that vow to my mother by staying in Pyvindian, without the weight of that promise, I was left hollow and empty. Over the next three days, I found myself joining Lucian and then on Andreas's old patrol while Tamlin hunted the grounds for the bog, unseen by us despite being an occasional bastard. Lucian didn't seem to mind my company, and he did most of the talking, which was fine. It left me to brood over the consequences of firing a single arrow. An arrow I never fired a single one during those three days we rode along the border. That very morning I had spied a red doe in a glen, and aimed out of instinct. My arrow poised to fly right into her eye as Lucian sneered that she was not a fairy, at least but I stared at her, fat, healthy and content, then slackened the bow, replaced the arrow in my quiver and let the doe wander on. I never saw Tom Tamlin around the manor of hunting the, bo the bog day and night. Lucian informed me. Even at dinner he spoke little before leaving early, off to continue his hunt night after night. I didn't mind his absence, it was a relief if anything. On the third night, after my encounter with the pucker, I'd scarcely sat down before Tamlin got up, giving an excuse about not wanting to waste hunting time. Lucian and I stared after him for a moment. What I could see of Lucian's face was pale and tight. You worry about him, I said. Lucian slumped in his tree seat, wholly undignified for a fey lord. Tamlin gets into moods. He doesn't want your help hunting the bog. He prefers being alone and having the bog on our land. 
I don't suppose you'd understand. The pucker are minor enough not to bother him, but even after he shredded the bog, he brewed over it, and there's no one who can help him at all. He would probably shred them for disobeying his order to stay away. A crush of ice slivered across my nape. He would be that brutal. Lucian studied the wine in his goblet. You don't hold on to power by being everyone's friend. And among the fairies, lesser and high fay alike, a firm hand is needed. We're too powerful and too broad with immortality to be checked by anything else. It didn't seem like a cold, lonely position to have, especially when you didn't particularly want it. I wasn't sure why it bothered me so much. The snow was falling, thick and merciless, already up to my knees as I pulled the bowstring back. Farther and farther until my arms trembled, behind me a shadow lurked. No, watched. I didn't dare turn to look at it. To see who might be within that shadow, observing, not as the wolf stared at me across the clearing, just staring, as if waiting, as if daring me to fire the ash arrow. No, no, I didn't want to do it, not this time, not again, not. But I had no control over my fingers, absolutely none, and he was still staring as I fired. One shot, one shot straight through that golden eye a plume of blood spattering the snow, a thud of a heady, heavy body, a sigh of wind. No, it wasn't, a wolf. It, it wasn't a wolf that hit the snow. No, it was a man, tall and well-formed. No, not a man, a high fay with those pointed ears. I blinked, and then, then my hands were warm and sticky with blood. Then his body was red and skinless, steaming in the cold, and it was his skin, his skin, that I held in my hands, and I threw myself awake, sweat slipping down my back, and forced myself to breathe, to open my eyes and note each date, detail of the night, dark, bedroom, real, this was real, but I could still see that high fey male face down in the snow, my arrow through his eye, red and bloody all over from where I cut and peeled off his skin, bile stung my just a dream, even if what I'd done to Andrea, even as a wolf was, was, I scrubbed at my face, perhaps it was the quiet, the hollowness of the past few days, perhaps it was only that I no longer had to think hour to hour about how to keep my family alive, but it was regret and maybe shame that coated my tongue my boots. I shuddered as if I could fling it off and kick back the sheets to rise from my bed. So that was chapter 10 and chapter 11. I thought as they're both quite short little chapters that I'd read them both. I hope you enjoyed it. I kept mispronouncing I hope you enjoyed this video. I'll be back.